Hello and welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm excited to be here today with Umbrex member Jared Simmons. Jared, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Will. I'm excited to be here. So, Jared, this is part of our sort of mini series around cost reduction, cost optimization. Uh, you're an expert on design to value. You did that at McKinsey and subsequently and before. Tell us a little bit about, like, first, maybe start with the definition. Tell us what, what is design to value? Sure. So design to value is a, a set of tools and a work process that's organized around increasing profit, uh, increasing value uh, for the company and for the consumer. And so that can take the form of uh, a number of different, um, it, it could take form in a number of different ways, uh, but it's always about increasing the value to the consumer and reducing the cost to the to the uh, company to produce or deliver it. Great. Um, so maybe maybe you can walk us through a case example to help us understand what that really entails. Uh, sure. So uh, so we've worked with uh, a number of different companies around this process, uh, but uh, I'll abstract one for that for for this conversation. Um, let's say we were trying to um, to increase uh, to drive cost out of a, um, a, a a wipe, um, and we know that the wipe has a certain thickness, which makes a certain cost for the substrate. We know that the the lotion on it um, has certain ingredients, and that has cost associated with it. We know that the Primary packaging, the 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 box that it comes in um, has cost, and we know that the secondary packaging, the case that is delivered, it's delivered in the tertiary packaging, the the case that's delivered that's delivered to Walmart or or Target um, has costs associated with it, and moving it back and forth from the plant as well. Um, the production process has cost in it. And so design to value is aimed at taking a look at end to end across that entire value chain from starting materials all the way through to the use of the product at at home um, when you pull the wipe out of the out of the box. Um, where can you drive cost out? And so um, it, it, an example would be looking at. Uh, so the way we would go about it is to look at what does the consumer care about? And so we look at what value, what the, how the consumer defines value in that space. So maybe a consumer doesn't care as much about lotion as they do about the substrate. Uh, and so maybe what we might look at is how can we trade the cost in one material or cost in the other that will actually drive profit. So what what we might do is use a less expensive material A. Uh, for the for one for one piece of it for the for the substrate uh, and use and add a little bit of cost to the lotion to up the benefit so that we can talk about it and so we've driven we've now driven down our bottom we've now increased profit by not only driving out cost but adding back cost that uh, that actually drives profit for the company so that's that's designed to value is how can we move cost down and consumer value up in such a way that we can we can actually drive profit as well. All right, very cool. So let's say that you and I were going to write a design to value playbook and kind of walk a smart, intelligent you know, person, but who hasn't done this before, through the process kind of end to end. Um, maybe what would you, if we were starting high level, what would you say would be kind of the chapters or steps in the design to value playbook? I think the the first so the first step is defining uh, value and creating a shared understanding of what that value is. Some organizations are about maximizing profit. Some organizations are about maximizing volume or throughput. Um, some organizations are about driving out cost. And so the first step is getting the entire everyone is responsible for each step in the value chain on the same page in terms of what the program is intended to do. So so often it's it's impossible to come back from 
that uh, for misalignment at that step. Okay. So when you say understanding value, we're talking about value for the uh, the company that's running the project, but there's also value for the end you know consumer of the product. Right? Wh which one are you referring to? Uh, in this at this moment, I'm talking about what is value for the for the organization. All right. So, so like, what are the goals of the project? Maybe. Um, Th that's right. That's all right. right. So, because we don't want to get confused with like design to value for the okay. So, come up with the goals for the project. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to cut costs? Are we trying to make it more of a premium? Are we trying to grow volume, market market share? Figure that out. Okay, good. First step. That's uh, the first step. Yes. What's uh? What would maybe just run through the remaining steps and then we can dive into some of them in more detail. Sure. So then it's a matter of mapping out the value chain end to end. So starting materials all the way through to um to it, the in in use um, and understanding the basic cost structures associated with each of those steps. So mapping the value chain. Okay, map value chain. Okay, that's number two. We'll get back to that one. Sure. And then, but then keep going. What's number three? So then, what you want to do is understand uh, the consumer uh, priorities or preferences. Um, There's a lot of terminology in that mm -hmm. space, but basically, what does the consumer care about, and what are they willing to pay for? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So, and this is assuming that it's a current product that already exists, right? So we've mapped out the current value chain. Um, I guess you could also do this for a potential future project exactly. product of, you know, what do we think it's going to look like? But that's right. Um, map, map out that value chain for an existing product, let's say. Figure out consumer preferences and what's step four? So step four is finding a way to map those two to each other. Okay. So what what does a dollar of del uh, delivery cost get me in terms of consumer preference? Mm -hmm. What does a, a 50 cents of raw material get me in terms of consumer preference? Okay. And then, so we map those and then what's step five or chapter step, five? Yeah. Chapter five is, is uh, creating projects and programs to, to capture the defined value. Mm hmm all right, cool. So I think I can understand about chapter one, step one. We're going to understand the goals of the overall you know, effort. All right, mm -hmm. What's the company trying to do? Okay. Right. Walk me through, though, step two, um, mapping out the value chain. So let's say we have a you know, smart consultant who hasn't necessarily done that before uh, and says, okay, I got the idea. There's probably a lot of nitty gritty and lessons learned involved in secret tips and tricks. Uh, how would you like? What would the you know, what would the sections of that chapter be? Mapping out the value chain. Sure, uh, I think the the first step is to get um, to get a a shared understanding of who's responsible for which steps in the value chain. So, what are the steps in the value chain, and what are the decision rights and and responsibilities within those? Where, where things kind of fall apart sometimes is you say, okay, well, there's incoming raw materials and then there's then there's converting those materials into a, into a product. Um, and some of the costs in that box of converting raw material into a product aren't controlled by the operations organization. So, mm -hmm. so it's a, there's a difference between mapping the unit operations and the steps and how it gets converted and mapping who's responsible for which costs where. Um, and that that is the the that's the nitty gritty of that front end is who sets the price for the incoming raw materials? What is it based on? Is it regional? Is it geographic? Uh, you know, are these costs um, different if they're delivered to different places? Uh, what's the impact of currency, all these other things. So there are a hundred different ways you could alter the cost of the starting materials alone. Does that make sense? Yeah, but, but talk for another few minutes about this piece. So even uh, there's a couple different elements of it. It sounds like one is the incoming raw materials. One is two is the converting the products. Um, I don't know if there's any other ones, but maybe double click on 
incoming raw materials. We assign someone to go do that. You know, you're running a team. You have a smart senior associate. Yep. You say, okay, uh, Jared, give me some, how do, give me some guidance here. How do I, how do I do this? Sure. Uh, so usually in a large company, and that's what we'll, we'll focus on here. Usually in a large company, there's a person responsible for buying the product and a person responsible or the raw starting material and a person responsible for specking it, saying this is what we need that to meet the performance of the product. And so you have to have a good working relationship and understanding of how each of those people go about their jobs for each each material class. Um, for example, in the procurement in a procurement organization, um, one procurement manager may be trying to uh, maybe fighting um, shipping costs. The other mm -hmm. procurement manager might be fighting uh, currency. Uh, an another one might be trying to move to a, you know, from supplier X to supplier Y. Uh, so you have to understand what they're trying to, what they're trying to accomplish within their role and how that affects the total cost to the, to the project. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so that would be my first you know, kind of bit of guidance um, to that senior associate is to get, is to understand what the, which are the high leverage starting materials and which of those are, you know, are being managed in a way that we can take advantage of um, their goals to accomplish the uh, driving driving cost out. Hmm. And I imagine there's a lot of complexity at this because you might get, maybe there's something where you have to buy a hundred of them at a time and they have an expiration date and you could get the per unit price, but maybe your operation only uses 57 at a time and they throw the rest away because they expire. So you have to be probably pretty careful about the cost accounting on this to figure out. And also you're going to want to ignore the shipping cost to your point. And uh, there may be even like an internal cost to place the order and to, you know, receive it and quality control it and so forth. That's, that's exactly right. And there may be a strategic reason for having them in the, in the value chain. Maybe, you know, they only have this one SKU that you've been asked to look at, but they have that SKU so that they have a, so that they are a qualified supplier and they're in the mix as a backup for 60% of the other volume. Mm. Um, so there's always these unintended consequences to kind of moving these levers. When you come in to do a cost optimization project, um, you know, you have to you have to respect the intelligence and and effort of the people who are who've been working every day and yeah. not just look at the sheet and say, oh, this is they're paying 20 cents for this. That's ridiculous. You know, I, we can get it for 10 cents over here. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's usually an answer as to what what makes that cost palatable uh, for that procurement person and the rest of the organization. Great. Um, and then in terms of the kind of converting the products piece, what you're doing internally to it, uh, talk to me about some tips and tricks you've learned over the years and some things that can get you tripped up related to that. Uh, I think that one of the biggest items that can trip people up in this area is external benchmarking. And I know as a consultant, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, uh, for me to, uh, to say that external benchmarking is a is a problem, but for this work, DTV across the entire value chain, um, internal benchmarking is much more valuable than external benchmarking because uh, because you don't have the context on how how that other organization reached that number and what goals they're trying to accomplish. So that's particularly problematic in the converting process because of the amount of capital involved and the amount of labor involved. And um, if you try to match one of those numbers across companies or across business units or across regions, um, I've seen a lot of projects uh, go sideways um, trying to do that. Now, when you say internal benchmarks, I can imagine if you're producing dog food at 20 different factories, then you'd have some good internal benchmarks, right? You could probably hopefully have similar accounting methods at your different 20 plants and you can compare your conversion cost 
Um, but to say a little bit more about, you know, how you would go about getting internal benchmarks, why you might want them and, and when they might be valuable, when they might not be. Sure. So the, that's a great example. Um, if you make the same product across multiple plants within the same currency in the same basic geography, um, it, there's, there are fewer um, potential, there's less of a potential to, to kind of be misled um, by that. The best internal benchmark to me, in my opinion, is the current state, whatever is currently happening. Um, and it's amazing how little understanding um, some project teams and consultants coming in have of what is currently going on. Um, because once you establish this sort of dashboard and say, okay, well, these are the eight metrics that we're going to move, and this is the project, and this is how it's scoped, it's very easy to lock into that uh, sort of view of the world. And, um, and, uh, and, for me, getting a full picture of you know what is what is driving each of those numbers is is what I consider an internal benchmark and what I consider um, to be much more valuable than um, a case study or a um, um, an example from uh, you know another business unit or another another company. Let's go on to uh, section this sort of the third step, which is understanding consumer preferences and what people actually care about and will pay for. And um, what, how would you kind of break that down into some steps for people? Mm -hmm. um, I would I'd break it down into uh, sort of functional and, and psychographic segmentations. So a psychographic segmentation is kind of what I think and believe about the product and the benefit. So, you know, I'm looking for a <clears throat> I'm looking for a watch that provides me with a sense of status and style versus a watch that is functional and can work under, you know, under a, a thousand meters of water. Um, that's a, a, a psychographic. This the function style is uh, sorry, the style and and uh, prestige sort of mindset is a psychographic kind of view of things. If I am looking for something that works underwater, you know, keeps time to the thousandth of a second, it's tied to the atomic clock, those are features. And so that's more of a functional um, segmentation. And so most, most categories um, segment out along one of those two lines. And one of those two lines usually is predominant in the class. And how do you go about actually determining uh, this? How how do you, um, you know, get this insight? Yeah, it's an artful combination of qualitative and quantitative research, different types of methodologies, one-on-one um, -on -one interviews, focus groups, dyads, triads. Sometimes you expose them to different versions of the product in those conversations. Sometimes you don't. Um, on the quantitative side, there are all sorts of um, concept-driven, non-concept-driven questionnaire uh, type um, um, assessments you can do uh, to get quantitative data to say, you know, um, statistically speaking, are these are these options different in the minds of the consumer? So it's it's an entire field in in and of itself. Um, but it's it all usually boils down to talking to people about a product or actually having them use it and give and giving you you know quantitative scale based responses. The um the dyads and triads, what's that mean? Oh sorry. So um one-on-one -on -one interview is just one you talking to one person. So I, you know, in my uh baby care days at PNG, you know, I would sit across from a mom and hand her a, a baby wipe or hand mm -hmm. her a, a shampoo um, or talk to her about her experience with a baby wipe or a shampoo. Um, a dyad would be one person talking to two. Um, that's useful when you still want to make sure you hear, you get depth, but you also get, um, you know, 
one one mom may say, oh, you know, I noticed that it felt a little rough coming out of the package. And the other mom would might say, you know what, I didn't think about that. But now that you mention it, I noticed that too. Mm -hmm. So you get a little more richness for the dyad than a one on one. And then the triad is three and then full focus groups are usually four, six, eight. Oh, I see. Um, when you're doing quantitative, uh, some of that might be, I don't know, conjoint analysis or some things. To tell me about some ways to set up quantitative work on this that actually gets results. Because if you just ask people, what would you prefer? Sometimes you don't get it maybe as accurate as if you're potentially asking for real trade-offs. Like, which would you prefer? Like, this set of features in this price, this set of features in that price. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a bit about um, how you do that quantitative research. Yeah, and I'm going to talk specifically in the context of design to value. What's usually what's super helpful in the context of design to value isn't would you like this fully finished product? Do you like this 2024 Mustang? It's more it's more like which of these five steering wheels get you know makes your hand most comfortable, and then separately you can start to you can do a separate analysis to understand how important steering wheel comfort is in the overall process of um in the overall uh purchase intent um calcul you know uh, unconscious calculation going on in their in their minds so um conjoint a lot of times tend to ask function you know how important is this and how much would you pay for it at the same time? Mm -hmm. And that's just a, that's a lot of, that's a lot of math and decisions for people to make. If mm -hmm. you're, especially if you're going back to, if your goal is just to go back to say, okay, we, we can take, you know, five millimeters out of the diameter of the steering wheel. Yeah. So the, but mm -hmm. like, so on your baby wipe example, let's say the team has, whole bunch of ideas around how to reduce the cost of product, but still provide most of the value or maybe even increase value with changing it. And maybe it's a premium baby wipe right now. That's, you know, it has aloe vera and it's or organic materials sure. and it has like no scent because people are upset by the scent. And, you know, it has a few other, I mean, other sorts of features to it. Right. Yeah. Um, how would you go about trying to sort out which ones people actually care about and will pay more for, which ones they sort of like but would not pay more for, which ones they actually dislike or something, mm -hmm. but particularly trying to figure out the expensive ones, the aloe vera or something, is it worth the extra 10 cents of you know cost to add it there? How, how would you be figuring out on like multiple dimensions when it's not just pick which one do you like better, A or B, right. but there's a lot of different – a lot of different factors. How, how do you do that research? Um, prototyping. So um, building it and having them react to it in a in either a, a single product test or a pair comparison test. Single product being, you know, five people use this one, five people use that one, five people use the other one, and you trust that those five those groups of five people are similar enough that you can compare their responses. Um, paired comparison being. Half of them, half of the group uses product A and then and then product B. The other half uses product B and then product A, and you compare their their you know their per, their preferences across their answers. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> so the the bottom line is um, conjoint has a lot of wonderful benefits and uses um, for design to value. The key is getting to a functional prototype. That people can interact with and, re and react and respond to. Mm -hmm. So, um, so for baby wipes, that's 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 one thing. For you know, a seven forty seven, that would be something different. Uh -huh. um, so it's it really depends on where you are on that continuum. And um, and again, that's why it's so important on the front end to say what we're trying to do here is drive out costs because you're going to find all sorts of opportunities in the consumer work. And as things come float to the top, there'll be things that marketing gets excited about. There'll be things that the uh, operations folks get excited about. There'll be things that procurement gets excited about. If you don't have a single 
single North Star to say, this is what we're doing with this program. Um, that's where sort of um, competing priorities and um, can um, can create, can lower morale and drive people out of the process. Mm. So let's move on to the next stage, um, mapping those two together. So we've done our consumer research. We have a sense of what their psychographic they prefer and their functional and their features. Um, how do you about now integrating everything that we learned about the supply chain and the cost structure and consumer preferences uh, in in this step? So um, this is a a critical step, and it and it's not math. It is um, it's decision rights, it's priorities, um, and it's and it is a um, an, a fundamental understanding of the company, the industry. And the consumer. So, um, back, you know, if we kind of flash back to the procurement conversation, um, you have to have someone in the room who has decision rights across that entire value chain. So they can say, yes, this consumer prefers this, and yes, it would save us $10 million in this type of cost, but we would have to move, we would have to then go qualify a new supplier on this in this other place, and that would cost us $25 million. So we're not doing this. So putting them together is really more of a uh, construction is a more of constructing scenarios, and that's that's an important step. And it's important to have external support on the, this part in particular, um, because the what ifs can get very um, there's a lot of rabbit holes and a lot of possibilities. And helping you need you need someone that's not cl as close to the to the implications to be able to say, okay, we're that we're, we're not going, you know, based on the priorities that you set, this this doesn't seem like it's a it's a good fit. So we'll put that over here and leave that with this organization to look at in the future. Okay. Um, I'd love to hear a bit about your firm and your practice. Switching away maybe from the playbook now, sure. just giving us a sense of in the real world. What sorts of impact can these programs had, and you know some of your experience with that? Sure. So, um, so our firm is a, a, a small small firm. We're um, a boutique consultancy. We work in the innovation space. Uh, we just have a few employees, and we we staff up for bigger projects through through partnerships and and collaborations. Um, and so, our goal is to be able to come in and support the team that is doing the work. So rather than bringing the playbook and installing a new pro work process, we we come in and learn their work process and fit and adjust it and tweak it to fit the intent and the principles behind the, the, play, the playbook. Um, so we, we find that that actually speeds, speeds the adoption of, of design to value principles. Um, and it also deepens the understanding um, because it leaves, uh, it gives the organization, uh, the, the the employees in the organization, um, the opportunity to bring their expertise to play in a construct that they're already familiar with. So they're not having to learn design to value and figure out what how what they know fits into that. They just do what they do, and we show them how it fits in. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what sorts of uh, like what sorts of products or services have you worked on? I mean, obviously, yeah. keep it sanitized, but but whatever you can share at a at a sanitized level. Sure, sure. So we've uh, we've worked on um, a yo yogurt portfolio. Um, uh, we've worked on a uh, uh, sports drink, nutritional drink portfolio. Um, we've actually worked on. Distribution, um, a company that distributes gas products, um, uh, gas um, control products, so the meters mm. and the things that are associated with that. Um, we've worked with uh, a few other few other industries, um, most very similar to in the CPG space, um, but we've we've applied it in in. In, uh, in some other um, domains as well. But those are a few examples. 
I'm curious if you could give some examples of things where you've discovered that, you know, companies are providing it, whether, you know, it's a feature or it's part of the packaging or something. Mm -hmm. And when you've looked into it, you found that customers didn't actually value it that much and you were able to eliminate things. Um, I mean, my own experience, sometimes like you, it seems like sometimes you get stuff from Amazon now and it's not in a fancy box. It's like the box is the box. Like, so you were talking about secondary and tertiary packaging. Mm -hmm. It seems like they've somehow, some cases gotten rid of that. Um, but I'm curious, like what you found where companies just from, you know, historical, whatever, they do it in a certain way. And when you've gone in, you found out that customers don't actually care about that feature or that piece of it. You can just not deliver that. Right. Yeah, no, we've we've definitely found uh, we've definitely seen that in a number of different places. And I would say the. Um, the theme across the places where we find that is the closer. The cost is to the perceived equity of the brand or the company, the more likely that is the case. Um, so I, we've literally been told yes, this is inefficient. Yes, we're paying too much for it, but don't touch it. Um, and and it's it's like, you know, people, you know, <laughs> it's, we also um, do professional development coaching for, for STEM professionals. And, you know, there's always, you know, the things that are closer to how you define yourself as a person are the harder things to work on. And it's the same with a, with a company. So, um, so what we tend to do is you know, track it, you know, document that we've identified it, offer it up as an option, and if they choose to not pursue it, that's that's always the client's prerogative. What sort of savings can a company capture? And obviously, this would be a pretty wide range. But sure. in your experience, what have you seen in terms of how much savings can you capture if that's your goal with one mm -hmm. of these design-to-value programs? Yeah, we try to we try to we only take on projects where we think we can deliver ten times our what we would charge to do the work. So, um, so if we're working with a you know a billion dollar firm, um, and they you know they have a a hundred million dollars in addressable spend that they want us to look at, um, and we think there's uh, a ten million dollar savings opportunity within that our question is can we can we help them capture that for a million dollars or less mm -hmm. so it's less about what they can save and what leverage they can get on on their time investment i see but in but in terms of like the spend what would you say is the typical range for mm -hmm. let's say let's say a typical even you know make it specific to cpg and sure. kind a of company um someone you know a company that has some kind of something in the cpg you know category uh either a beverage or you know one of those center aisles there at the grocery store sure yeah, yeah. If you do design a value on it what's the typical cost savings you can think about is it like anywhere from five percent to fifty percent or what would be sort of typical that you could capture without you know reducing the value to the end consumer that much yeah um I would say it's probably more in that five to fifteen percent on a going basis, depending on what your what your comfort two things your comfort level um, with driving out cost uh, and and changing things in, in the product, and then and then how much of that work you've done already. So if if you know if I'm going into Procter and Gamble for example, there's less opportunity I already know uh, because they have this as part of their DNA. Um, whereas if I'm going into a a company that has grown quickly, maybe they're a coffee roaster or something that, you know, has grown quickly and suddenly they're a fifty, hundred million dollar business, there's probably a lot of opportunity there um, to drive out costs because uh because they, you know, they don't have the staff and focus allocated allocated to capturing it. Great. Uh Jared, for listeners who want to follow up with you or find out more about your practice, where would you point them online? Uh, our website, outlastllc.com. 
Um, you can find us, we're Outlast Consulting on LinkedIn. Um, I'm Jared Simmons uh, on LinkedIn as well. Um, and uh, those are probably the, the the best places to go to 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 reach out. You can request a consultation on, on our website and uh, talk to me specifically. Fantastic. Well, we will include those links in the show notes. Jared, thank you so much for joining today. Oh, thanks for having me, Will. Always a pleasure.